Okay, so a, uh, a brand new Wednesday noon book study. And um, this is maybe a little bit in line with what we did uh, last time where we had sort of a devotional classic. It's, it wasn't that old. It was uh, you know, a little over a hundred years old from uh, A.W. Tozer. Um, but we are doing something kind of generally similar in the thought of a spiritual classic. A little bit older though than uh than a than hundred years uh pilgrim's progress by john bunyan was actually written in 1678 um so it's it's been a minute uh as the kids might say so this is a uh you know 350 year old work roughly um and the language of the original reflects that. Um, this is, uh, you know, it, it is it is written uh, with some very early, really even pre Elizabethan um, syntax and language and verbiage and stuff like that. Uh, even the spelling. Uh, so one of the things that I recommended was. Uh, a particular book, a particular copy. This one happens to be written by a man named uh, Alan Vermeil or Vermeil. And uh, because he's just updated the language without trying to change much, he's, he's trying to change as little as possible, but, you know, more contemporary American spelling, um, some vocabulary that is a little more. Um, you know, appertainable to us that, that we don't have to kind of look up maybe quite so often. So um, you can get a, a, a free PDF copy online in a million different places because this is way in the public domain. You know, like I said, 350 years old. Um, I actually read uh, both to, to kind of, uh, you know, a few chapters worth of both just to kind of get it started. And uh, actually, I, three versions. I, I read a, a very old version. I you know, read through some of this version, and I read through another version that is you know, from a few decades ago. Also a rewrite, but somebody else's rewrite, just to kind of get a feel for what the language does. It is not dissimilar, in a sense, to uh, different Bible versions and translations. Um, they have their strengths. And they have their weaknesses. Whenever you translate from one language to another, I, I remind people frequently, there is no mathematical formula for a one-to-one -one correlation. So um, every time you translate, you choose. And you try to make the best and wisest, clearest choices possible. But um, there will always be a word that means more than one thing or a phrase that doesn't exactly translate or, or, or uh, an internal sense of the rhyme or poetry or whatever that can be difficult to convey in a completely different language. So um, reading uh, what the, the way John Bunyan wrote it is not dissimilar to reading an old style King James Version Bible. And by old style, I mean real old style, like, you know, where the word public might end with a CK. CK. <laughs> um, so, um, so anyway, it, it is all roughly, you know, the same, but, uh, you know, the King James version of the Bible is written roughly in this same time. Um, the 1662 version of the book of, Common, uh, you know, um, Cramner's book of common prayer is written roughly at the same time. As a matter of fact, there's kind of a, there's an interplay between all of these things, which is why I bring them up. So. Uh, I thought for this first class, we would do just kind of a brief one, but more of an introduction and, and kind of talk about uh, the, the book in a, in a very general sense. Uh, won't take real long with it, but uh, again, this is coming from the sort of uh, late 1600s. Uh, 17th century England is going through a variety of upheavals. Uh, John Bunyan, the author of this, was personally involved and present in some of these upheavals. So uh, earlier in the same century, 
we have a conflict between King Charles I and Parliament, which will eventually result in the English Civil War, the overthrow of the monarchy, the execution of the King of England, and the naming of Oliver Cromwell, the head of Parliament, to be the Lord Protector of the Realm. So now uh, there's a, a, a period of, it, it's, it's relatively brief, called the Interregnum now, but uh, there had been basically a revolution in England, and there was no more monarchy, only Parliament. Uh, now Cromwell uh, basically ran the country like a dictator. Uh, it sort of required really a very strong, forceful personality to make kind of forceful individual decisions. And the reason I say that is because when Cromwell dies, the whole thing falls apart within years. You know, it took the, the, the force of will of this, you know, kind of masterful guy. Uh, and, uh, you know, depending on who you talk to, you're gonna get a very, very different perspective on Oliver Cromwell. Um, but you know, regardless of that, uh, what happens just within a few years after Cromwell dies and his son tries to take over, it goes nowhere, the whole thing kind of falls apart. They welcome back Charles II and they reform a, uh, a monarchy. Now it's a, it's a parliamentary constitutional monarchy and there's kind of different rules set and such, but it is to say that John Bunyan, who fights in the English Civil War on the side of Parliament while he's a young man, kind of understands this sense of upheaval and the social change and the uh, really deep and sharp religious issues of the day. And you, you can't really understand him as a person without taking into account a lot of the things that are happening in England, in Europe, in the world around him. This is, uh, this is not the beginnings of the Protestant Reformation, uh, but these are really kind of the, the reckonings of the Protestant Reformation. The Reformation, which begins the century before, but now has been around for so long, it's become so prevalent, it's become so prominent that countries like England are forced to figure out what are we going to do with, it's not just a handful of people, it's a whole movement, you know, if, if half of the people who are going to church in England are not going to Church of England congregations for the very first, what do we do? How do we run our country? Are these people we can trust? Is this, is this heretical? Um, issues that we would find very confusing these days. Why are you fighting over that? But at the time, they seem to be worlds apart from each other. Um, the nonconformists that Bunyan is a part of, basically not conforming to the rules and the laws of the Church of England, be it more like Presbyterians or more like Baptists or more like Quakers, you know, whatever it might be, they were, they were referred to as the nonconformists because they would not conform to the pattern, to the rule, to the law, to the prayer book, all this sort of stuff. And England was passing laws. These were laws on the book for the entire realm. You have to do these certain things. You know, to say that the, the Church of England was the Church of England is to say, like, if you wanted to work in the government, you had to go to church, the Church of England. You had to take communion at a Church of England church that followed the 1662 prayer book. That was a law. Now, you can find a lot of context if you're willing to do some reading and the thinking and some, you know, find out more about this. It's never quite as simple as the bad guys and the good guys. It's never quite as simple as the mean authorities and the brave revolutionaries. Um, you know, there were real issues of governmental stability. There were real issues of how do we ensure that not everything is turned upside down? How do we keep 
you know, how do we just keep things running if everything is up for grabs? How do we do the simple tasks of government that the people expect of us if there is so much upheaval, we don't know who to trust with what? To be a nonconformist, does that mean you're also against the rest of the government? Well, if that's the case, maybe you shouldn't work in the government at all. So there's some more understandable reasons why they came down as hard as they did, but I think it is worth noting they came down hard. And John Bunyan was a guy who in his life felt the brunt of how hard they came down to try to put everything together. There is a, it's kind of cliche, but this is true throughout an awful lot of human history, world history, geopolitical history, that when there is a lot of things up for grabs, if you grip too tightly, you don't make things better, you make things worse. That's not to say you should let everything go, but maybe there's a way to swing the pendulum too hard in the other direction, and it doesn't actually fix the problem, it just creates new ones. This, these, these laws of conformity will be repealed. They'll be repealed within Bunyan's lifetime, but this is a guy who's gonna go to jail for years because he is preaching without a license from the government. Now, that sounds completely bizarre to us, especially when we, when, we, when we consider, you know, well, I mean, England and the, you know, the uh, Anglicans and they're, you know, this is the broad church, the via media, this is the, uh, this is the, the, the middle road and the middle way to what, all that's not been settled yet. You know, we're talking about issues that we can look back in history and we can identify as uh, having been resolved, they are still in the process of being worked out now. So what does it really mean to be the middle way between say uh, the reformed movement and the Roman Catholic church? What does that mean? What does that look like? What is the middle, the exact middle? More to this side, more to that side. How, you know, how do we work all this out? And um, I've, uh, I've, 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 you know, my brain is already registering that I've already made an error about saying this was early Elizabethan. This is post Elizabethan. Um, you know, Elizabeth is before Charles, who's uh, Elizabeth is before James, who's before Charles. So, you know, I've got this a little out of order here. But regardless, um, there's a lot going on that we look back now hundreds of years later as the issues have already kind of been resolved. And we can wonder, well, why was that such a big deal at the time? But I just want to say in our own lives, mm -hmm. when we've had moments of crisis or moments of, you know, very significant changes say in our families or our job situations or whatever, there's a period of time right around that where everything feels momentous. Everything feels super significant and very sharp. If you look back years later, it's all sort of worked out and you have had time to live with the results. And so it can, you know, kind of be strange to look back and think, well, wow, I was really, really worried about that at the time. Um, come on in. Yes, come on in. We have had a uh, we have had a late edition. Uh, we are uh, recording to post so people can watch later. Um, but welcome. I'm just giving a little bit of an introduction. Uh, we've been talking about. Uh, just sort of the context of, of uh, how and when Bunyan is writing this work. You know, uh, it's first published in 1678. Um, he is a nonconformist, which uh, within England at the time, he is basically sent to jail for preaching without a license from the government. Um, I am was given kind of a bit of context to say, I'm not trying to defend what the government did, uh, but it's to say, we can look back, you know, nearly 350 years later, and we can think, man, why were they so worked up about some of these things? With the reminder that sometimes in our own lives, when there's been a moment of crisis or a big change or whatever, there's a period of time right around it, everything seems super momentous. 
and everything seems incredibly significant and important. But if you look back years later, it can be kind of hard to remember what that was like because we've, we've, had the, we've had the luxury of dealing with the consequences rather than feeling like we're in the throes of it. So this is a huge time of upheaval, uh, as I had mentioned to them. Uh, this is in the after effects of the English Civil War. This is after the interregnum period. Uh, so the monarchy has been reestablished, but Bunyan himself fights with Parliament, with Cromwell and the Roundheads to overthrow the King of England when he is a young man. Um, so he's a nonconformist. He would be closer to what we, uh, I mean, at the time, they would have maybe, this would have been maybe closer to Presbyterianism. Um, these days, uh, you know, maybe closer to, I don't know, Baptist. To call him a Pentecostal would sort of get closer to the fervor, but not really to the, not really to the, 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 the spiritual element of it, because that's kind of a movement of later. But, but the fervor, the personal stake in their faith is, number one, it's kind of new. And number two, it stands in contrast to a lot that's been happening for a long time. So, uh, you know, history is a lot of ups and downs. And within the Protestant Reformation, one of the things that is, you know, one of the major issues that comes up, it's, it's part of the Reformation itself, it, it's, it's in, it, it's in its after effects, is this issue of the personal stake in your own salvation. Rather than the pendulum swinging over the centuries to a more corporate sense, you are a part of the wider body of Christ because you live in the parish boundaries and you were baptized and perhaps you have you know, attended the parish church and received communion at, at some point or whatever. Um, but you know, you, you, you heard scripture proclaimed or you've heard a sermon read to you by the, the clergyman, the, the clerk, um, who themselves, a lot of them weren't educated enough in the scriptures to preach from it. They were given a book of homilies written by somebody else that they were supposed to read. So, you know, remember that until relatively close to this period of time, those living in England would not have a Bible written in English. The Bible was in Latin, the Bible was in Greek. Um, the Bible, uh, as, as far as common languages, would then be in first German. Um, the English Bibles, this is what people like Wycliffe, um, you know, there was a lot of turmoil. We're, we're talking about maybe a hundred years of having the Bible in the hands of people. So this sense of, I am going to read this. I am going to struggle with its meaning and its consequence on my life. My faith is something that is central and important and a relationship with God through Christ in a manner that has a palpable sense and a hold on my daily being, a conviction that changes me. These are issues that anyone could have dealt with at any time, but for a lot of folks and a lot of cultures, the pendulum had swung in the other direction. And now the pendulum was swinging back and it's swinging back real hard. Uh, and Bunyan is a part of that, or maybe even an after effect of it. He's writing in such a way, the more you read this, you can almost feel him try to grab you by the shoulders and shake you. You know, he's almost, some of these chapters I'll read, I'm like, man, he's like a street preacher. And, you know, uh, we, we had a guy, uh, we had a guy at University of Florida who, and he did like a circuit. Like I didn't realize, but he was famous at other schools and, and he was a real piece of work. Um, their websites, you know, detailing this guy being a, not, 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 not as good of a guy as he would have, as you would have hoped, but he would, you know, just be in the, in the, in the area for us in the Americas, but we're, you know, students would crisscross and preaching, I mean, legit fire and brimstone. And when, you know, other Christians might say, Hey brother, like, you know, maybe there's, you know, more flies with honey kind of stuff. 
and you know you would get straight up rebukes. No, they are dying and about to burn from hell, and it's up to me to you know pull them from the jaws of Satan. And you know you are, you know you're letting them die, and uh, you know there was a lot of the fervor, which I don't think in that guy was. Anyway, with Bunyan, I think it, it's coming from a deep and sincere heart of faith that acknowledges how the pendulum had swung so far in the opposite direction. These were issues that people felt like they didn't even have to bother with, but they were of eternal significance and personal importance. Um, this is a book that is deeply, deeply personal. It's very clearly personal to him. You, you can almost, you know, you almost feel like if I was reading the original, you could like see tear stains on the paper because it's it's very emotional. It's, it's, it's almost wrought with emotion. But it's also with kind of a focused sense of this should be important to you. If you're reading this, you ought to come across with a sense of that's me. And I need to do something about it. So lots of books can do that. Lots of books can try to encourage you or admonish you or direct you. And I think Pilgrim's Progress is definitely, definitely doing that. It's, I mean, he's, he's pretty in your face for an awful lot of this. Um, so, you know, again, this is a guy who, for his faith, a faith that is, um, you know, a lot of it expounding on things that we would completely take for granted today. Read your Bible. You, you read your Bible. We'll have somebody read it for you and explain to you. You read it. Pray. Not have somebody pray for you or just, you know, say you're praying when everyone else in the room is. You pray. You have a relationship with Jesus. You have a change in your life and in your heart. You feel the weight and grief of your sin. Our prayer book folds in a lot of these, you know, um, especially the right one liturgy, you know, where our, 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 our the, the remembrance of our sins is grievous unto us and the burden of them is intolerable. It's great language. It's very, very provocative. It's very powerful. And it's all true. You can't carry the burden of your sin. Doesn't matter who you are. Now, do we tend to walk around these days? Oh, my sin is such a... No, but we could. I would say that's not necessarily to our credit that we don't. But then again, I'm not sure that I'm prepared to, you know, just cry about my own wretchedness all day, every day. Like, I mean, I, I do other stuff too. So, yeah, not again. Yeah, right? It's still true. Right? You know, we are wretched in our sin. And yet it is God's grace and not our personal goodness, righteousness, or morality that reconciles us to him and with each other. And sometimes we are all in need of the clearest and starkest of terms. Does that mean we have to live there every day? I'm going to say no. Um, I, think, I think stuff like John Bunyan is a part of this balanced breakfast. You know, like the commercials that have the sugary cereal and the orange juice and the toast and the bacon and like, man, I, I love a breakfast like that. But like all the food groups are represented and, you know, the, the idea that this may feel a little unfamiliar in its fervency. Part of the reason it feels unfamiliar is a lot of the things that John Bunyan preached and pushed have been so absorbed within the wider church, we can take it for granted. We have the luxury of taking it for granted because people like John Bunyan changed the church. Um, we, uh, this, is a, this is a digression. I support Curcio within the church. I think it is a, it's a wonderful program. I have been a spiritual director a few times. I made my own Curcio many years ago. I support people going. Um, but Curcio as a movement is 
has a lesser impact today than it did when it started in the late 70s and early 80s. And part of the reason why was it, there's that pendulum again. You know, the sort of music that was revolutionary through Curcio for an Episcopalian in the early 80s, or uh, uh, I, I served on many Faith Alive teams back in the 80s. 80s and 90s, um, the sort of witnessing personally to your faith, you know, that was at the time far less common. And for a lot of people, it was a new experience and it was a blessed thing. But you know what? The church as a whole sort of absorbed a lot of those lessons. And Curcio maybe makes less of an impact 30, 40 years now, because a lot of what it was fighting for, it won. I almost feel like telling people, hey, it's cool, you won. You're good, you know, and, and there's still a place for it, but it's but it to say a lot of what made it so revolutionary and it would strike so deeply to the heart of people, like that style of music, or at least that perspective that music that both spoke doctrine but also appealed to your emotion that was very unfamiliar in the late 70s early 80s well find an episcopal church that doesn't do that and i don't mean praise music i mean like even picking hymns you start thinking in those terms because some of the things that they wanted people to think of they okay yeah you're right i'll do that so, um, <clears throat> this, again, this is here's my big digression with our just kind of our introductory stuff. But some of the things that were non conforming, he is a non conformist um, in the 1600s, were eventually adopted and incorporated within the Church of England and then in the wider, you know, uh, body of Christ throughout the world. Um, it is a noteworthy moment, though, within this change and within this incorporation because it made such an impact because there just hadn't been anything like this. It is credited by some as the first novel ever written in English. That's a big deal. It is uh, also considered basically the first, like, Christian devotional classic written in English. The, what it intends to do through a work of allegorical fiction to explain the faith and to offer um, you know, devotional encouragement and Christian living had never been done before in English. Uh, that's, that's really where its genius and greatness is. Uh, some of this will feel a little on the nose, like, it's very allegorical, and sometimes the allegory is like, we're going to meet Mr. Obstinate and Mr. Worldly Living. I mean, it's like, okay, you know, you're not hiding that one a bit. You know, it's, some of this is going to be very simple in its terms. Um, and we can say, well, couldn't he be a little more, you know, where's the subtext? And couldn't he be a little more creative? It takes someone who is young to watch I Love Lucy and say, this is boring and cliche because I've seen it a million times. Yeah, you saw it a million times because they started it. If you were watching I Love Lucy in the late fifties, you were laughing at jokes that had never been done before and it was revolutionary. Well, now that same joke has been told 50,000 times and it feels a little stale. Well, that doesn't make I Love Lucy stale. That's kind of where I'm, I'm kind of getting to this. So some of the things that we might consider, well, I read a book, you know, so-and-so, and, -so, and he, he did that same thing, but he did it better, or he did it with more nuance, or he did it in a way that kind of grabbed, well, yeah, but nobody had done it before. Um, you know, who, who is the genius artist? The person whose drawing looks more realistic or the person who first thought 
to make a mark upon paper to represent something that had never been done. And so to you know, degree, that's why he, this is lasted. This is nearly 300, plus or minus 350 years old. And people still, it's still in print. People still talk about it. Uh, that's something, I think. That is something. So uh, as I mentioned, John Bunyan, will, he'll spend, I think, two stents in jail for preaching without a license, basically being a nonconformist pastor. He was uh, uh, considered uneducated. He was a, um, a tinker, uh, which is not a profession we tend to think of very much, but basically he, he, uh, he made and fixed metal objects, which especially this, you know, uh, who's gonna fix my teapot or what it will, a tinker might. You know, who is going to make the hinge of this door? A tinker might. You know, this is somebody who would go and they would you know, make little things and fix little things. And so he was poor. He was definitely like, a, you know, consider him maybe a blue collar guy. And yet his, his passion and fervency for the gospel, which doesn't occur until he is already a, a young man, he's not raised this way. Um, and his ability to write in a way and, and speak in this non, like if he was a really bad, boring preacher, maybe they never send him to jail. But he was the sort of guy that people would crowd around and once they heard he was preaching, they would kind of come from all over. So um, he just had a, a way about him that was very inspiring. It was very, uh, it was captivating even. And he really hits the heart, the emotional heart of a lot of these spiritual topics. And that really stood in contrast to the, uh, you know, the priest of your local uh, Church of England congregation who was reading from today's selection of the book homilies. And he was reading like this, but, but you knew you were given the approved curriculum, you know? Um, so, he had already written a spiritual autobiography by this by this point, John Bunyan had, and then wanted to do something new. So he incorporated elements of stuff he'd already written, talking about his own life, um, coming to Christ, what that meant, what he gave up, what he gained. And then he started rolling in some other things he'd written and other sermons he had preached about the practical experiences of daily Christianity. How can I help you understand what it's going to take on a day-by-day -day basis to serve Christ? To be a professing Christian whose citizenship is in heaven. And that can mean something today. Well, what can it mean? How do you do this? How do you incorporate that? And so he would you know, write these little pamphlets or whatever, or, these sermons. And so Pilgrim's Progress really kind of comes as a, a synthesis of these different things. It's, it's pretty autobiographical in some ways. In some ways, it's, it's just intended to be like his spiritual advice to any Christian. Um, <clears throat> so the style that it's written, allegorical fat, uh, fiction. Uh, if you've not started reading, uh, gets a little bit of unpacking. So an allegory is a story where it's basically a symbolic story where things mean something else. Characters mean something else. Actions mean something else. Uh, it's related to our concept of metaphor um, where an allegory in its closest way possible. Remember how we talked at the very beginning about how when we translate from one language to another, there's not a mathematical formula for one-to-one -one correlation. Allegory tries to do that in a story sense. Allegory tries to, to, to give you a point. Like, I want you to know something. So I'm going to make up a story that corresponds to the details of this point. So as you hear the story, you're actually hearing me make my point. Um, it was a, a, a famous dividing line 
between uh, fellow friends and inklings, C.S. Lewis and uh, J.R.R. Tolkien. Um, Tolkien always kind of got twitchy at the Narnia books that he thought were far too allegorical. C.S. Lewis didn't like allegory either. He said, I did not write any allegories. You know, there's not a single character or a single event within the Narnia books, he would say, that is an exact correlation where I've just changed names or whatever. Um, and so it was kind of a difference of opinion. How close to allegory can you get without being allegory? And the reason they didn't like it is because it seemed to be sort of a, not just a lesser sense of fiction, but almost like didactic as a teaching tool, not a storytelling tool. They wanted to tell stories. The stories had points. The stories they would certainly hope would inspire us with particular thoughts and even actions. But allegory is almost like, you know, like a spelling book when you're a kid. You need to learn how to spell, don't you? Well, of course you do. And so we're going to keep it as simple and as straightforward as possible. Allegory is simple and it's straightforward. Um, in some of the earlier texts, you're actually going to get this somewhat lengthy introduction from John Bunyan himself defending his use of fiction to teach theology or Christian practice. Because it hadn't been done before, he's basically getting criticism like, oh, you're cheapening the faith by telling a story. And he has said, well, no, if you look at Jesus, Jesus told parables. You know, Jesus wanted to teach, say, about humility and trust in God. So he told the story of the rich man whose tower wasn't big enough to hold all of his grain. So he thought he would tear it down, build a bigger one and live a life of luxury. But then he died and he got nothing. Oh, well, this isn't really about a rich man and a tower, is it? It's kind of about me. Oh, yes. It is. You know, so it's the parable. And so, but this hadn't been done before. So to tell a person, well, if you're a disciple of Christ, you ought to do A, B, C. Well, that's a way to do it. He says, I want to tell you A, B, C. But instead of calling them ABC, I'm going to call them one, two, three. They are ABC, but one, two, three is a little more interesting. One, two, three might appeal to someone who doesn't want to sit in a classroom, but they do like to hear a story. Jesus himself told stories to crowds knowing that that appeals to us. We tend to listen when we're engaged, when our thoughts and our minds are inspired. Our, our imaginations are hooked. So I'm going to tell you the ABCs of the Christian life of a disciple, but I'm going to rename them in the form of a story. And maybe it's going to hook someone who wouldn't have stopped to listen, but now they will. So like the street preacher, He's trying to be as clear as possible, but he's also trying to cast that net as wide as possible. Um, allegory is intended to be simple and it's intended to be basic. That's not a criticism of him being a bad writer. It is to say his intention is to be as one-to-one -one as possible. There's not a lot of nuance and subtext, but there are some things we can talk about. So when we get to some of these things, it's not so much about what does he mean? We're gonna see what he means pretty clearly. But where I think we do have lots of room for discussion is, what does that mean for me? How can we apply it? Where do we see that? Have you had an experience similar? Um, and that is one of the things that allegory can do. So this is a story of a man named Christian who is going on a journey. And on that journey, there are many temptations and obstacles and twists and turns but there is a straight and narrow path through a narrow but not wide gate that will lead to a celestial city and eternal home yeah it's a little on the nose but it's still creative 
And it's the first time something like this has been tried. Everybody else who does it, whether we think they do it better or worse, everybody follows his footsteps. He's the trailblazer. And I think that's, that's kind of worth noting. Um, and a lot of people have written a lot of things. How many of them will, be, will people still be reading in 350 years? Because they are still reading this. So one of the difficult things that there will be about this book and about a group discussion is the chapter length. You will have chapters that are a page long and chapters that are 10 pages long. You'll have chapters that are intended to just give you one quick point and chapters that will subdivide themselves into other pieces. And so what I'm going to try to do is give us chunks, but those chunks are going to change. This is not an easy book to say we're going to read one chapter a class or three chapters a class. Honestly, it's almost going to be unique every time. So, um, reading through the first section just this morning, just so I kind of, I felt like I knew if you guys had come prepared, we would talk about it, but if not, we're going to give an introduction. And this is what I suggest when we come next Wednesday, I would like us to do chapters one through four. Each one of them is quick. They're like two or three pages a piece. And it's going to take us to kind of a, and they're, they're going to sort of work together. And it's going to take us to kind of a stopping point. And we'll see that on Christian's journey, there will be times where he's sort of walking, you know, and he's going to pass by a few different things. Each one of those might be a quick chapter, but then he will hit something kind of significant. And at that significant point, there might be more time or more reason to sit and talk. So we'll try to sit with him and talk for a while too. But if we do one through four, uh, for next Wednesday, I think it'll kind of feel like sort of a, a complete thought. And then the next time we're going to do, uh, I, I think we ought to do five through seven. Um, and the time after that, I think we're only going to do chapter eight. It's just one of those things, like suddenly you're, we're going to hit a chapter that's like 12 pages long. So um, we'll, we'll try it. We'll see how this goes. If you guys tell me, hey, I did one through four and it was still way too quick. We can always make these longer. But um, if you come back and you tell me, look, you know, we, we pushed a little further than we did when we had to, or we, we started talking, we only covered two chapters instead of three, then, you know, I'll try to be a little flexible with that. I would just say his chapters are not mathematically precise. They kind of, however the spirit moves him, you know, he's, he's going to write a page or he's going to write 10 and you don't know to get there. Um, but I, I give you a lot of, uh, what I hope will be useful to just kind of orient you. Um, and when you find stuff that feels a little weird, bring it up. We'll talk about it. It some of this is going to be contextual. You know, he really is writing in the 1670s and that's different, but uh, a lot of these themes, a lot of these ideas, a lot of the issues are universal. We might have to see well, what does that look like today? How might we apply it now? Um, but uh, this is a journey that is not unique to him because it is a journey in many regards that every Christian walks. For Jesus to say, to be his disciple, we must take up our cross and follow him it means a few things. Number one, we are going where he has led the way and he is willing to show us. Number two, a cross implies difficulty and suffering. Number three, he doesn't actually say pick up my cross. He says pick up your cross. So there's some level of individuality or uniqueness to it. And then finally, for him to say, follow me, you pick it up, you follow, then implies a consequence on our lives, a decision, a choice, 
an action, something that we must do once we know. And that's what I hope we're going to get from uh, Pilgrim's Progress. Anything else? Okay. So um, next Wednesday, one through four, this will consider, uh, I'll, I'll, when I post this on uh, YouTube and on the Facebook page, it'll just, you know, introduction. And uh, hopefully anybody who wants to jump in or just do this like outside of class time, um, this will get them started and they'll know for next time they'll do one through four and we will, uh, we'll see how that goes and we'll just, we'll play it by ear for a little while with these ever changing pieces and we'll just kind of see if this is working out for us. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much.